It happened nearly 30 years ago, and yet I still remember the lesson. We were watching my brother-in-law, John, perform at the Michigan uh, Marching Band Competition Finals at the Silverdome. I don't remember the first bands to perform. Nothing stood out about them. But then Milford High School took the field, and Debbie and I graduated from Milford, and now John was attending. And so Milford's show was phenomenal. They performed excerpts from Jesus Christ Superstar, and, and they had colorful costumes and theatrics. I mean, it was, it was like a halftime show at, at a professional football game. It was that good. Lots of movement. And they received, by far, the biggest ovation from the crowd. Well, there was only one band left to perform, Lakeland High School, which was our crosstown rivals. They were from Milford as well. And they were the reigning state champions. They were introduced, they marched in, and they took the field. And they began to play their music while they were marching. And they made some various figures on the, on the field. They played and they marched, they marched and they played. And I got to tell you, I was waiting for something more, something spectacular. But that was it. They marched and they played. When they, when they finished, they received an ovation not nearly as loud as Milford's. So we waited for the judges to tally their scores, and we anticipated the results, and finally they were announced, and this year's Michigan High School State Marching Band champion is Lakeland High School. Yeah, I know, Jim's kids, Jim and Vicky's kids went to Lakeland. And I thought, are you kidding me? What an injustice. That is not right. We put on a production, and they marched. Come on, be serious. So when, when John came out, I shared my thoughts. I was hoping to cheer him up. Man, I said, you guys got ripped off. You should have won. Your show was phenomenal. All they did was march. And I still remember his response. When you march and when you play as good as they do, you don't need anything else. You don't need the glitz. And then he said, they were near perfect and a dazzling show is a cover-up for the flaws from high school. I mean, that is not only a good observation in marching band competition, but also in life. My pages are sticking together. So let me repeat that again. That's not only a good observation in marching band, but also for life. How often are we impressed by the dazzle? And we overlook the flaws. And I think secondly, perhaps a more important question is, who are we playing for in the first place? Who, who is our audience? Because on the field of life, we can play to the crowd or we can play to the judge, which is God. And understand that each judges according to different standards. Whose applause are you seeking? Milford entertained the crowd with great success, but they left disappointed when they came before the judges. Lakeland realized that the crowd is not going to be dazzled by our performance, but it didn't matter because that was not their primary concern. Knowing the judges evaluate by a different criteria, that's what they played to, and as a result, they achieved their goal. God's standard is different than man's. And it has nothing to do with being flashy. He calls us to, to keep in step or in unison with Jesus. That is the goal of our faith. How do we do that? It all begins with attitude. Last week we had our praise service, and thank you, Scott, for leading that out. We focused on, on thanking God for, for the good things that he gives us and praising him for, for what he has done and what he is doing in our life, in us, through us, and around us. You know, we often sing the song, 10,000 Reasons. There are endless reasons to praise God. And yet many times, we are so caught up in ourselves that we don't take time to praise God. We get distracted by our activities, our worries, our goals, our to-do list. That thanking God gets lost 
in the busyness. And therefore, today, we're going to focus on how to walk in step with Jesus, which develops a life of praise. Not just once in a while, but a life of praise. And we're going to look where, where Jake had us this morning in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. This is commonly known as the Lord's Prayer. It's more like the model of prayer. He taught us how to pray. But I got to tell you, years ago, my prayer life began to change. I had been getting up early every morning, and I would go for a run, and, and I would get up about 5.30, and so this time of year, you know, it was dark outside, and I remember coming out one day, and it's dark out, I look up, and the stars are just shining very brightly in the sky, it was a perfectly clear sky, and I just, I was in awe, and I said out loud, this is a beautiful morning, thank you, God. Now, that was not unusual, I had been doing that for quite a while. And then I would typically proceed into a time of prayer, which typically revolved around what was going on in my life, my take on things, and what I wanted to happen. But as I looked up and I saw the uh, stars, it reminded me of our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And so I began praying, God, it is amazing that you have created this universe, and yet you, you care about me, and, and you have created me. You are the giver of life and the sustainer of life. In fact, I have another day of life because you allow it. Thank you, God. You have not only created me, but, but you are my, my father. You're my dad. And you love me just like I love my children. And, and, and you want what's best for me even when I don't want what's best for myself. Thank you, God. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And so I began praying that that his name would be honored, his name would be praised throughout the world. I prayed for those who deny that God exists. I prayed for those who acknowledge God with their lips, but not with their lives. And I pray that, that my life, my actions, and my words would bring glory to him. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. So I began praying for his kingdom. I began praying for the church, the followers of Jesus. I prayed for those that I knew that that are not Christians, that they would come to faith in the saving name of Jesus. I prayed for, for my church at the time, and those who would be coming for the first time through the doors. And, and I pray that their hearts would be open. And that the Holy Spirit would, would definitely give them encouragement. But he would also convict them where they needed to be convicted as well. I prayed for other churches in the area. And I prayed for their leaders. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. And I prayed for his will to be done. Back then it was in the upcoming elections. I don't remember who was running for the president at the time. I just prayed for the election. I prayed for his will to be done on the the property we had just bought right next door to the church. I prayed for my family, for Debbie and Ricky and Lacey, for his will to be done in their lives. And of course, I prayed for his will to be done in my life. Now, let me ask you a question. Is that how you normally pray? Because it surely did not sound like my typical prayer. As I began to pray through the Lord's Prayer, I realized that that Jesus, as he's teaching us to pray, he's saying we are to focus on God. He says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. The focus is on God. And made me think, how often do we enter prayer in the presence of the Almighty Creator And we put the focus on on ourselves, on our wants, our needs, and our desires. Think about that. It's kind of like going to a birthday party for someone else, but we demand that, hey, you serve my favorite kind of cake. And and I get to open all the presents before the guest of honor. I get to play with them first. See, when, when we go to God in prayer, it's God's party. It's not ours. And yet, because of who God is, 
He's very generous with us. And in fact, our life is better simply by being in his presence. And you ever think about this? God gives away some awesome door prizes. And it's not that God doesn't want us to focus on our thoughts and our concerns and our heartaches. He does. But if we become the focus of our prayer, then we seek our will rather than his. We demand our solutions rather than listen to him. And we try to manipulate our way rather than trust in his power and his timing and his way. And that's why the focus needs to be on him. Otherwise, we pray with a preconceived mindset. I, I came across this, and I, it struck me as humorous. A man experiencing a crisis in his life called the toll-free psychiatric hotline. This is what he heard. Welcome to the psychiatric hotline. If you are obsessive-compulsive, repeatedly press 1. If you, are code, if you are codependent, ask someone else to press 2. If you have multiple personalities, press 3, 4, and 5. If you're suffering from paranoia, we know who you are and what you want. Stay on the line until we trace the call. If you're a schizophrenic, listen carefully. A little voice will tell you what to do and which number to press. If you are bipolar, press them all in no particular order. And if you're depressed, just wait and do nothing because it's not going to make a difference. Thank you for your call. You know, I, I found that pretty humorous. Yet it reminds me of the unfortunate truth about prayer that quite often we approach God with a predetermined mindset. And the focus is on us. And so we determine what's going to happen before we talk to God. And since we haven't truly sought God's counsel, we don't hear from him. And yet Jesus is teaching, when we come to pray, the focus is to be on God. Because that's when we experience his power. Not only are we to make God the focus of our prayers, but Jesus said as we pray, we are to focus on God's purpose. Hallowed be your name. Your name kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven louis giglio wrote a book titled i am not but i know i am and no he's not schizophrenic it's a reference to how god identified himself when moses asked who should i say has sent me and god said tell them i am has sent you and louis point is this none of us are i am God is God, and we are not. But each of us can know I am intimately. In fact, I am has created each of us. He's created you and me, and he has placed us in this world for a divine purpose. Not that we have to figure it out because he's already created it for us. It's the reason we're here in the first place. As we begin to see God's power in every situation, our personal desires slowly fade into the background. We suddenly comprehend this big picture from Christ's perspective. We're seeking the greater good for everyone rather than simply our personal wants and desires. And what happens is, as we focus on God's purpose, our prayers begin to change. We pray for his name to be glorified, we pray for his kingdom, the church. We pray for his will rather than our own. And we start praying more for others than for ourselves. And we pray for our politicians, whether we voted for them or not. We not only pray for those who are sick and in need, but, but we, go on, we go beyond the prayer for just physical healing, but we pray for the Holy Spirit to work in their heart and in their life to draw them close to Jesus. Because ultimately, that is more important than any physical healing. Jesus said, what good is it to gain the whole world and lose your soul? We will pray for our enemies with compassion for them because we realize they're lost. In fact, we will pray for many things that we've never even prayed for before. And we'll find ourselves praying for different things 
and our prayer list will change daily. It's amazing how as we begin to focus on God rather than ourselves, it changes how we view the situation around us. It changes how we view other people. In fact, it changes how we view ourselves. And we gain insight into how God wants us to change our attitude and not just the other person. Because if you're like me, it's like, God, please change this person rather than look in the mirror. And I got to tell you, the hardest thing about praying, your will be done, because it can make life incredibly difficult and uncomfortable for us. One morning, I asked God, I was praying through the, uh, the fruit of the Spirit. I said, God, I would love more love and joy and peace and pain. I went through everything, but I skipped patience because I knew what that would mean. Did, <laughs> do you know how some of the older versions translate patience? Long-suffering. Who wants to pray, God, I want to suffer longer? I know I don't. And so yet the next day I was, I was convicted that God was trying to teach me something, so I prayed for patience. And the following morning, I took the prayer back. I said, God, I do not want to learn this lesson. I'm happy the way I am. Someone else might have a problem, but that must be their problem. But I'm okay. I took it back. See, as we pray for God's purpose in our lives we learn the lessons that God has for us. And it's not easy, but it is always worth it. Sometimes our trials are the only way that that God can work his purpose in our lives. If we don't go through the trial, then his purpose is not going to come through. And, And many times, his purpose is exactly what we're praying for. We just don't realize it's part of that. Jesus said to focus on God and his purpose. And the key to doing this is by focusing on God's provision. Give us today our daily bread. God gives us everything that we need for this day. You know, that morning as I was out walking, I I saw the Big Dipper, and and there it was the next day and the next and the next. And and it kind of reminded me that that every day God has this large helping and this big dip of blessings or his best for my life. But not only physical needs, but emotional needs and spiritual needs as well. God has the best for me. And I like it when he scoops a, a big dose of his best onto my daily plate. God always provides exactly what we need. Just not the way that we always desire or expect it to happen. And so we begin to doubt God, like Adam and Eve. Focusing on God's provision leads, uh, builds our trust in Him. Focusing on God's provision builds our trust in Him. Trust leads to contentment. I have exactly what God wants me to have at this point in time. Trust leads to peace, that he has the situation under control. I don't have to worry about it. Trust helps me to remember that when the time is right, he will give me exactly what is needed. Listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians. Chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And think about that. As we pray and we are allowing God to work within us, he is able to do far more than we can ask or imagine. And this this promise applies to every area of our lives. I don't know, I read that and I think of the old song where we sang... God can make a way where there seems to be no way. So focus on God's provision. Let's review. Jesus said that when we pray, our focus is to be on God. We are to seek his purpose in every situation. We are to recognize his blessings, which will help us to trust him. And lastly, he says to seek and live out God's will. Forgive our debts, or forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
this last part of seeking and living out God's will, it is essential to growth. Because without it, we will never experience the full power of Jesus in our lives. Though our faith ha- has the, the potential to be a high-powered V8 engine without focusing on and, and seeking out Jesus and God's will, we'll be running on four cylinders and we'll never quite experience all that we long for. However, when we seek and we live out God's will, we experience his power in ways that we never imagined. The key is living out God's will. I mean, think about that. Our will is to get even and make them pay, but yet God's will is to forgive. Our will is to give in to temptation, and God's will is for us to say no and to trust him. Henry Blackaby wrote in Experience in God, many people will ask, what is God's will for my life? He says, that is the wrong question. The question is not, what is God's will for my life? That puts the focus on me. The question is simply, what is God's will? That puts the focus on God. So what is God's will? Jesus told us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So are we loving God with everything that we have in every area of our lives? Does our attitude, does our lifestyle cause others to praise God? God not only has his will, but he has his plan to accomplish his will. Again, it's different than man's. The Bible says, do nothing out of selfishness or vain conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourself. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Honor your father and mother, not just when you agree with them, but honor and obey them always. When someone mistreats you, turn the other cheek. Forgive. Go the extra mile. So God not only tells us to live a life that causes others to praise him, he tells us how to accomplish it accomplish it the problem is we get our marching orders from God and then we go out onto the field of life and we create our own routine and we're not walking in step with Jesus if you're walking in step with Jesus are you praying Lord forgive my sins as I forgive others lead me not into temptation but deliver me from evil If we're not examining our lives, if we're not looking at at the sin and areas of temptation in our lives, then we're going to keep giving in and we're going to continue to let Satan distract us. And ultimately, as we do that, we miss out on the blessings of God. Jesus talks about forgiveness. Forgiveness is not just about the other person. It's for us as well. An unforgiving heart steals our joy and it leads to bitterness. I remember reading the story. It was after the Civil War, a very bloody war. Robert E. Lee was visiting a Kentucky woman, and she showed him the remains of this once grand old tree in front of her house. And then she just bitterly described how it was destroyed, limbs and trunk, by federal, uh, federal forces artillery fire. Well, knowing that, that Lee disagreed with the North, she expected him to condemn the North and at least sympathize with their loss. But she, she went on with this bitter description of what had happened and Lee didn't say anything. And then after a silence, he finally said, cut the tree down, madam. Cut it down and forget it. Think about him, that. A man who has been fighting a battle against an enemy, but he realized that It is better to forgive the injustices of the past than allow them to remain and let bitterness take root and poison the rest of our lives. So these are not just two separate thoughts. Hey, forgive us and lead us not into temptation. They go together, and unforgiveness is just one of the ways that the evil one can enter our life. As we journey through life, 
Satan tries to block our path. He tries to distract us and get us off course. His tactics include temptation and deception. And Satan will play on our, our pride, our bitterness, our selfish desires. And understand, if he can't distract us, he will put obstacles in our path because he wants to discourage us so that we'll give up. There is nothing Satan will not do to keep you from seeking and living out God's will. So how are you doing on the journey of faith in life? Are you truly seeking and living out God's will? Do you have a repentant heart that mourns over your sin? Are you allowing bitterness, jealousy, pride, self-centeredness to block your progress? Are you giving in to distractions and temptations? Or are you getting discouraged because of the obstacles in your life? I remember coming out one morning to run, and I always, at this point, I'm always looking up at the sky, looking, you know, at the stars and the Big Dipper and all that, but I came out and it was foggy, and, and I couldn't see the stars, I couldn't see the Big Dipper, and yet it's exactly where it was the day before, the day before that, and the day before that. I just couldn't see it on this day. And it reminded me that even when I can't see God at work, He's still with me. Sometimes I have a hard time seeing him through circumstances, but he's still right there, and I still need to listen and obey him. The key to our Christian faith is having a heart and having a prayer life that focuses on God's plan, especially when we are tempted, when we are confused, or when we have been hurt. But when we take time to pray, focusing on God, trusting in his provision, and committed to seeking his purpose and his plan, we begin to march in step with Jesus. And as we do, as we march in step with him, we are transformed into the image of Christ. And just like Jesus, we find strength when we're weak. We find peace in the chaos, hope when we're confused. And our life begins to impact the world around us with the incredible love of God. And as we do that, we discover that God is doing more than we could ever ask or imagine in us, through us, and around us. And that is the blessing of walking with God. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this day. Lord, in this month of Thanksgiving, uh, we, we, we take time to thank you, usually. But Lord, it's not what we do all year long. Long And I pray that you would encourage us to, to walk in step with you, to take, take this prayer and to break it down and to praise you, to pray for your will. God, I, I pray that we would thank you for the good things in our life. I pray that we would resist the devil. I pray that we would forgive as you have forgiven us. And God, as we begin to pray through the Lord's Prayer, just open our hearts and our minds to your truth and what you want to do in our lives. We can begin to see the transformation taking place. Thank you for your love, for your mercy, and for your grace. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.